Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 23. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Okay, John. Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. 
Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Amen. If you need a Bible, then there is a pile at the back on my right. Um, and if you're following what I'm saying in the Bible, then uh, Isaiah 53, the passage that Jill has just read for us, is the one that you should follow. This is arguably the most famous passage in the whole of Isaiah. And in it, we see a marvelous picture that resonates so clearly with what happened to Jesus before and during the time he spent on the cross at Calvary. And we need to be aware that this was written some 800 years before Jesus was born. And it begins with this question in verse 1. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And this is the thing. God is going to explain to you through the passage of Scripture what He has done. And I will do my best in my humble and feeble way to bring some ideas out of that. But this is mostly relevant to those who are willing to believe. It is not enough to be interested. It is not enough to be sympathetic. Now, who does not feel sympathy if you are told of a man who is innocent and in contemporary situations has been sent to prison for a crime he doesn't commit, didn't commit? Here we have something worse. Because again, pretty much everybody who has a view on this has taken the position that crucifixion was the worst kind of punishment ever devised to kill somebody. You know, I'm sure that there are other dreadful punishments, but a lot of them were devised to make you talk. We were thinking about wartime earlier on, and obviously um, in modern times, tortures have been used. Sometimes we think of uh, medieval times and people being stretched upon the rack or something like that. But the idea was that the threat of using them was enough to make you talk and then you would be released. Or the pain would make you respond and then you would be released. But crucifixion served no other purpose than to kill a man. And it didn't kill a man because of the pain of having nails driven through your hand. It killed a man because it led to suffocation. Because slowly a man no longer had the strength to push himself up to fill his lungs, and then he would suffocate to death. And in the case of Jesus, we have also to remember 
that before he was placed upon the cross, he had been made so weak because of the punishment that the soldiers had put him through. But it is not enough to sympathize. It is not enough to hear the story. The question is, what do you believe? And God says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Because some people are in a very privileged state where they are helped by God to fully understand the impact of what God is doing and has done. And he describes the growing up of his Messiah who was to come as though it had already happened. It says in verse 2, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Now you know, if you are somebody who was a gardener, I was at Pat's place the other day, and she has a beautiful garden. Last Sunday I was having lunch with somebody, and they have a beautiful garden. But you know, if you are a gardener, that it is better to water but Israel at the time that the Messiah was going to come was a place of dryness, was a place that could not and did not respond to God. You know, I uh, sometimes see on television um, or elsewhere films about Jesus, and he is usually a very handsome man. You know, there is something about men with long hair, they always look very <laughs> handsome, uh, and they, uh, he is uh, a very handsome man, and he wanders around saying wise things, which is obviously the case, but he has his eyes set upon the heavens, because obviously if Jesus had come from there, that is what he would be like. But that's not the picture of the scriptures. Jesus' eyes were set upon the poor and the victims of injustice. And the Bible tells us very little about what he looked like. It tells us so little about it that people are still arguing about it and uh, finding all kinds of political claims in the possibility of it. But it says here, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Now in one sense, he had majesty, because he was fully God. But it was hidden. We couldn't see it. It says he was despised, and I'm in verse 3 now, he was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. The Bible tells us that Jesus said that he had no place to lay his head. The foxes have holes, and all kinds of creatures have a place to rest. But not this Messiah, not this man of God. He was a man of suffering. And the great truth here, as we move along, is that we find out that our problem became his problem. And that is always the case in our relationship with God. I've said before that if you are struggling in life, maybe because a health issue or maybe because life is full of trouble, it is better to walk along through that situation than and have God alongside you 
than to try and walk along alone. And Jesus' sufferings and his pains were our pains. He took them up. And not only to share in our humanity, because he was also fully man as well as fully God, but in order that when he went to the cross, he would be dying in our place. It says here that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. It's a strange trade. You know? He brought us peace. But in order to do that, he received pain and suffering and punishment. And it says in verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. And then in verse 7, a sheep before its shearers is silent. Now I've seen sheep being sheared before now. And they're not always silent. They wriggle around quite a lot. They bar quite a bit. But the point here, in this simile, in this image that we have, is that... God was given in order that we might receive. When a sheep is sheared, humanity gains a rug or a cover to keep it comfortable and warm. And when Jesus suffered, we gained. Something that would keep us safe for all eternity if we were willing to choose it. <clears throat> we have to remember very much that much of what we read in this passage is um, imagery. You know... Um, we have a word in the English, English language, um, infirmity, which means we are sick. Uh, from there, we have the old English word, infirmary, which is a hospital in current terms. And when it takes up the theme here of Jesus making us whole by his suffering. By his stripes we are healed, it says. It is our spiritual infirmity rather than our physical infirmity that the Bible is speaking of. It would be nice if it were otherwise, but the evidence does not support this. And the truth of the matter is that is not what God was saying to us in the first place. It very much is a case that we are sick, but we are spiritually sick. And therefore, this man bore our iniquities. He bore our infirmities. He bore everything in order that we might be made spiritually whole. It says in verse 9 that violence was done to him, though no violent, he had done no violence. And we know that terrible things were said of him, but there was no deceit in his mouth. And the detail here is amazing. 
It says again in verse 9, He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now it's not difficult for us to say that rich men are often wicked men as well. But we do know that the one who came to take Jesus' body, one who was on the fringe of becoming a disciple of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, was one who, because of his wealth, could provide a new, unused grave for this man that everybody else regarded as a criminal. And so, Jesus was put in the grave. But even then, we find out this is not the end of the story. Verse 10, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. But then verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. Now, I don't know how you think about death. It's almost one of those subjects that people are afraid to talk about. But as Christians, we should not be afraid. The one who has gone before us has died and then lived again. And those who follow him will also die and then live again. And let's be fair. It doesn't make sense because we have gone through life, we stand at the graveside, sadly I've done this in the last 18 months more times than I would like to and more times than usual for a church pastor and we share the scriptures we sing something um, like, Shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river? You know, I mentioned that one, so I know Pat wouldn't want me to be singing Abide With Me. Um, so, and then we lower the casket into the ground. We throw dirt and dust on top of it, we place flowers on top of it, and then perhaps our own men fill it in, perhaps the people who work for the cemetery fill it in, and then we walk away, and for most people who are there, if we are honest, even some of those who would think that they are believers, that is the end of it. And this was the thing with the disciples. When Jesus was arrested, they thought that was the end of it. That was the end of their hopes. When Jesus died on the cross, most of them were too far away to see it happen. But those who did see it happen thought that was the end of it. When Jesus came to Mary, she thought that it could be anybody other than Jesus, to the extent that she thought it was the gardener, the cemetery keeper, who would come to maintain the grave. And only when he said something memorable was she convinced. <coughs> Now for us, we have these scriptures. The weight stands on the fact that we were told, if we'd have been there, that this was going to happen long before it happened. And also we have been told that it happened. But we weren't there. But we have these proofs. It says in verse 12, 
For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now whatever you think exactly transgressors means, maybe you prefer the word sinners, maybe you prefer the word wrongdoers, I know of no other means by which one man's death could make peace for so many. Again, otherwise it does not make sense that one man's death is of value. People say the opposite. They say, well, nobody deserved to die like that. But especially Jesus didn't deserve to die like that. But he died because it was valuable to others. It was valuable to people like us. People like me. People like you. It was for us that he was cut off from the land of the living. But it is for us also that he saw the light of life again. And it is for us that he made peace in order that many could come to believe. And so the passage is almost like a circle because at the end we come back to verse 1. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? At the moment as we um, stand in this country, there is debate. Why are numbers in churches falling? Then you look at other situations and there are other churches where numbers are not falling. Why is the number of Christians in England falling? But then you look at other nations, particularly in Africa, and the numbers of believers are not falling. God has his times and his places and his ways of doing things. But the center of everything, the thing where it all comes to make sense, is at Calvary. Because Calvary was the thing that God prophesied through Isaiah. And Calvary is the thing that is making differences to lives even today. This is our hope. Amen. Amen.